Hi there. My name's Jessica Cole, President and CEO of Becker's Healthcare. Gary, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to spend the next 20 minutes with you. If it's okay with you, I'd like to start by going into your background and then get into some pre-submitted questions we have from our audience, ranging from common questions around costs, competition, and the future of computer-aided patient care. So let's first start with your background. You grew up right down the road from Intuitive headquarters in the heart of Silicon Valley. You started your career in science and worked for NASA at one point. Then you went on to get your PhD in fluid mechanics and thought about one point getting into academia. Can you start us off with a little about your early days and what changed your path to become involved with Intuitive? Sure, well, first, uh, Jessica, great to see you and uh, a pleasure to be with you today. Um, you know, for me, as you said, I had uh, grown up in, in science and technology, I was trained as a technologist, and uh, I was working in uh, defense programs at Stanford Research Institute, SRI International, which is up the road here from our headquarters. And uh, I got introduced to uh, the beginnings of a program that was uh, the early days of robotic-assisted surgery. It was run by uh, some of the pioneers in that space, and they were looking for help in controlling this surgical robot, this idea that they had. And I was invited to join that program, and I got a chance to sit down and, and try their prototype. And it was something out of science fiction, this prototype. I was not trained as a roboticist. Uh, and I got a chance to sit down, and they asked me to uh, uh, try to suture a, a rat femoral artery together. And it turns out in my past, I had done some model building. I was pretty good with my hands. And so I, I tried it. They kind of trained me as a surgeon in that setting, and it was really hard. Uh, and then they, they sat me down in front of the prototype that they had that they were seeking help controlling, and I tried that, and, and a light bulb went off for me. I, I just thought it was fantastic. And it was clear that while it was raw, there was just enormous potential in it uh, to, to aid this really hard microsuturing task. And so I went out to my, my boss at that time. I was a young man. And and said, hey, can I, can I switch on to this other program? And I had a, a good boss who was understanding, and he allowed me to devote some of my time to them. And, and at that point, uh, I, I was in. I thought uh, this idea for robotics, the potential to work on uh, advanced technologies that could make a difference in, in healthcare, uh, was super engaging. And that was the start for me. I, I later met some of the folks at Intuitive, but that was in 1993. That's incredible. Wow. Um, so during your 20 plus tenure, you, Intuitive is designed and commercialized um, four generations of the Da Vinci surgical systems um, that have performed over 8 million surgeries in global regions all over the world. You entered the lung biopsy space um, with the ION endoluminal platform. I'm just curious, how do you identify market opportunities and what have been some of the most complex decisions you've had to make, Gary? Well, let's kind of take that question in, in two parts. You know, that, that first part of identifying opportunities, I, I think first we, we've had uh, from their very earliest days just a great team. And that team is a balance of, you know, great clinical insight from our first founders who uh, were surgeons and technologists and then great technologists. And, and the idea has been to look out at um, minimally invasive interventions and, and see where the, the outcomes, the clinical outcomes, are just not where they might be, uh, and really start with the end in mind. And that has been present from the earliest days in the company. So this kind of evaluation of where is there a, a procedure being done where it can be done very well in the best hands, but maybe it's hard to do that uh, broadly in the community. And then we look around and look for what can we do about it? Where are our technology skills or our solution skills that can match up with that? And so at that, at that time, that's really been the idea behind uh, what's driven our, our, our concepts. Uh, it started in uh, cardiac surgery in the earliest days and moved to urology and gynecology and ultimately uh, to where we are now in quite broad and multi-specialty programs. So um, that's been a great process for us. Uh, you had asked a compound question. I'll ask you the, the second part. Could you reiterate the second part of the question? Sure. Um, so it was, it was like, how do you identify the market opportunities, which I think the key specialties, some of what you're describing there, kind of where you started. Um, 
And so what have been some of the most complex decisions you've, you've made over the past 20 plus years? You know, as, as we start looking at, uh, once you know, we start with, let's start with the end in mind, where can we improve outcomes? Um, the hardest part, or I think the most complex part for the company has been, you know, the, the ultimate vision, I think, of where can healthcare go, the, the very long term, is actually pretty straightforward uh, to articulate. I, I think most people can look out and say, hey, um, we want to improve the quadruple aim, really, our customers' perspective, mm -hmm. and it's exactly right. Oh, hey, let's, let's improve outcomes, let's improve the patient experience, the care team experience, and lower total cost to treat per patient episode. I think that makes good sense. The hard part, I think, is establishing what are the phased steps to take a concept or a platform and bring value in the near term and have a stepwise pathway to get to greater value over time. I think that's the hardest part for uh, technology companies and in healthcare. Not so much the long-term vision, but the sequence of steps that have gotten there. And I, I think that's something that collaborating with our, our customers, Intuitive has uh, gotten pretty good at, that method of taking a step, making progress, and building the ecosystem out and building the technology out, building our solution sets out over time, something we just talked about in this last talk of how do you build capability in sequence. So the situation is not just what's a robot, but how do you get a program that delivers on these quadruple aim values? Sure, okay. That makes a ton of sense. Thank you so much for walking through that. Um, so when the healthcare community talks about robotic assisted surgery, uh, cost seems to be the number one perceived barrier to broad adoption of da Vinci surgery. What's intuitive thinking over the next kind of five years to help with that burden? Yeah, I, I'm glad you raised this question and it's an important one. One of the things that's interesting is the, the key metric, the key economics that really matter to the healthcare system, to patients, to payers, and to hospitals is the total cost to treat per patient episode. And by, what I mean by that is if, if somebody has a cancer, a prostate cancer, the real question is what's the total cost for everything, for the materials, for the staff, for the capital equipment that's in the operating room, for any recurring issues that come up and complications and so on. So it really is this iceberg problem. And a, a lot of times when uh, there's concern or critique uh, about costs, it's often around the material costs. You know, how much does the knife cost? How much is the scalpel or the needle driver? And the reality is that that actually is not the dominant set of costs. I understand it's important and everybody should look at costs, but a sophisticated cost analysis is really important. It's actually hard to do well, but it's something that has to be done well. So what we look for is, okay, a, a cheap knife, but a bad outcome, will increase costs completely. Mm. The, the biggest thing is what is the total cost for the entire episode of care? And that comes down to, okay, what are the costs in the OR? What are the costs for um, complications? What's the cost of additional time in the OR? What's the cost for the staff? As we look all the way through that, Intuitive does that analysis carefully. Uh, we employ um, dozens of economists now. We look at that data um, with clear eyes. Intuitive is a highly analytic organization. And we work with you, our customer base, to look at that data carefully also what we find when we do that is that often the best run programs are uh, cheaper than open surgical programs. They're often cheaper than laparoscopy. It's, it feels counterintuitive, but the total costs here are, are, uh, are quite well managed. We also work hard at something at intuitive we call a virtuous cycle, which is to invest in lowering the costs of our products through engineering changes and manufacturing efficiencies to share those uh, savings with our customers. And you've just seen that in our extended use program for our instruments, uh, also with some of our systems. And that, that helps manage some of the upfront costs. We're also quite flexible with, uh, with capital and how people wanna pay for capital or get access to our systems. So we can help manage some of the cost for, for our customers as we go through that. And we want to continue to do that. As, as we get uh, additional insights in our engineering, as we get additional volume, we can share those cost savings with our customers over time. But in the end, the final metric that's most important 
is total cost to treat per patient episode. And I think all of us need to look at that with clear eyes and with strong methodology. That makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you so much for kind of walking us through, you know, the, kind of these great elite departments internally to be able to, to really show the total cost as well. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so it's no secret that, that competitive technologies are entering the surgical robotics arena. Um, I think you did just a wonderful job, Gary, of kind of describing, you know, since 1993, some of the core clinical, you know, strengths that Intuitive's brought and, and how you've built the company. But just curious, what are your thoughts on the competitive technologies coming out? You know, the first thing I'd say about competition is it's a absolutely natural. I'd, I'd be really concerned if uh, there weren't uh, other organizations uh, going out and, and seeking to, to bring products and technologies to the market uh, that are of the type that we've done. Uh, it's clearly a validation of some of the things that we and others have been working on for many years. The second thing I'd say is that um, uh, customers uh, appreciate choice just as, as we at Intuitive appreciate choice. So I, I think that it's healthy, uh, healthy for the, for the market. With regard to uh, the decisions that folks make, uh, both at uh, designers of competitive systems and, and customers who are going to be evaluating them, I think that these are complex systems and uh, they involve a lot of trade-offs. So as we look at uh, other companies coming out with products, what I would say is that we've been really thoughtful about evaluating uh, these ideas. We often uh, build prototypes and assess them in our own hands rather than just on paper. Uh, and the decisions we've made over the generations of our product, we're now uh, in our fourth generation of multi-port system, and something we talked about in the earlier talk, um, it, it's clear that those are things where we've made conscious decisions about trade-offs. And I'd encourage our customers to evaluate carefully uh, alternative architectures with the idea that um, you trade different uh, properties off. Uh, and I feel like we've made some good decisions. The second thing I'd say is that, remember, the, the goal of uh, one of these programs, a robotic-assisted surgery program, is a great set of outcomes and improvement of the quadruple aim. And the robot is a tool to get there, surrounded by an ecosystem, as I talked earlier in my talk, of other products and services that need to be in place to help you get to that aim of quad aim performance. So in the end, it's not really a robot versus a robot. It's kind of a sexy thing to think about. It's actually not how it works. I think the way it works is, does an ecosystem in the organization that supports it help you deliver a quad aim outcome? And I think that's the, the total measure. Uh, I encourage folks to, to look uh, carefully and with clear eyes at what others are offering. Um, we seek to earn your business and earn your partnership uh, by making sure we understand uh, your needs that well and deeply, and that we have an organization that can deliver against those goals and is a pleasure to work with. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So w when you think about some of the competitive designs and their claims, does this change anything for you in the direction Intuitive is heading? You know, o over the years, we we've seen... Um, about 25 organizations uh, build robot-assisted surgery programs of some sort uh, to, to date, to where we are today. And uh, about 20 of those organizations uh, are no longer promoting or, or following those systems, and, and about five are still in the, in the market. Today, there are probably 100 different uh, companies out doing something uh, interesting in robotic-assisted surgery. And some of them are interesting ideas. Uh, many of them we've, we've tried before. We really ground ourselves in first principle design, which is what's the set of goals and needs that you're trying to pursue? And then how do we design our systems and our solutions to help you? Um, uh, we try to steer the car by looking out the windshield and, and not really looking out the rear window or looking left and right. We spend most of our time and most of our effort really digging deep to understand how do we help solve for that environment. That doesn't mean that we're not attentive to what other companies are doing, but that we, we really are driving our investments based on first principles. As a result, uh, for basically all of the architectures we've seen come out so far, 
uh, they haven't been startling. Um, cer certainly, uh, just speaking for myself, uh, in the, the 25 or 30 years that I've been working on this, uh, a lot of those architectural trade-offs are something that we've thought about. We may be wrong, um, but we have been thoughtful about how to present them. And I think in the end, uh, it, it will be uh, all of you in the field, uh, our customer base, will really evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of, of various um, technologies and architectures. And we seek to be the ecosystem that meets your needs best. So, Gary, throughout the pandemic, Intuitive led from the front. Um, they did. A, you guys did a phenomenal job of adapting to customers' needs. I think we're we're hearing that in many of your remarks, um, of keeping kind of the the customer at the core nucleus of of everything that Intuitive is doing. And so, whether it be through COVID financial relief, extended use program, the expansion of regional training facilities to address travel concerns. You know, if we could, I'd, I'd really like to hone in on training specifically. So, Gary, what what has worked well, and where do you see the future of physician training heading? Yeah, well, thank you for that. You know, I, I just speaking first to uh, our our joint response to COVID. Uh, cl clearly, co COVID has been a, a tragedy and a serious challenge for all of us. And uh, our our philosophy and our our principles were quite straightforward, which was. Um, we're a, a well-trained uh, medical device company in a time of global need. And our response was really just based on the principle of our, our job is to help our customer the way they need to be helped in the moment they're in with regard to the pandemic. And if that meant uh, standing down and, and helping our resources pivot to help them in some other way, that's what we did. And if, if it meant moving systems or loaning systems to help clear backlogs, then that's what we did. And so I, I think um, the company rallied around that set of opportunities. One of the things that became clear, and as you point out, yeah, during this time is that with travel restrictions, that training needed to change. Uh, we had consolidated integrated training centers for technology training to start at the start of the pandemic. And it was clear that um, getting on planes or driving great distances during the pandemic wasn't gonna work. And so our, our team uh, worked closely with our customers, we pivoted. Uh, and we forward rotated some activities that we had started from uh, virtual reality training, um, digital projection of training, online training resources in a personalized digital training methodology, some of the things I had talked about earlier. And then we forward deployed our training resources into local regions that were a short drive away from where our customers were. So we increased our digital presence in training, and we increased our physical proximity to our customer to help with training. Uh, and that has been a great uh, positive move for us. It's increased convenience for our customers. It's increased accessibility. Uh, it's made some of that material asynchronously available so you can get it when you need it. Uh, and, and it's uh, really improved uh, satisfaction. So we, we're, uh, we're pleased, and it's been a, a positive momentum or trend uh, of some of the things that were happening prior to the pandemic really accelerated in response to the pandemic. Thank you so much for all you've done. Uh, so moving moving here to the next question, I think, you know, you've talked about quadruple aim. It's come up a number of times here and, and how that's incredibly important. Um, so hospitals across the U.S. have made quite the commitment to obviously developing kind of this culture of quality, safety, and reliability. And so what is Intuitive continuing to do to enhance a culture of quality, safety, and reliability in and around the operating room? Yeah, I, I think it's it's vital. It's, it's an essential and core part of uh, what we do at the company and, and what we have to do together. Um, a few things that, that I think are essential in, in our part of, of quality and safety is first, you know, our products need to be reliable. They need to do what they say they're going to do. They need to be manufactured at very high quality. There's, there's a baseline idea that our products have to deliver on their promise and be readable, ready, ready, available, and dependable. Uh, it's something that we work on all the time. We believe in continuous improvement. Our systems are uh, remarkably reliable and stable given the complexity of the technology that's in them. So that's number one. Uh, the second part is... Um, highly trained staff, both our staff, but also uh, 
of making available outstanding training in the field with our customers. And that involves some of the things we talked about earlier, uh, fantastic technology training resources, a very well-structured training program. Uh, Dr. Corrett will take you through some of the things that we do in training. Um, uh, training uh, made convenient. And then uh, measurements, some of the things that I had talked about in my talk. Uh, start with a great uh, measurement and assessment of, of what's really happening in the world and then feed that back so that data is used to uh, inform actions and close loops. And we, we know that outstanding quality relies on a, a plan, do, measure, and improve cycle. And so the data is a, is a key part of that quality cycle. Um, the last thing, and I've said it a couple of times, continuous improvement. I think uh, describing the world as it really is, uh, measuring it, uh, being uh, uh, careful and thoughtful about assessment of that uh, capability, and then taking steps to improve is part of the culture of the company uh, and part of, part of our routine interactions with uh, our customer base. Great. Thank you so, so much. Um, so, Gary, what, what role do you see Intuitive playing in lobbying for governmental change and reimbursement? Moving to a place where da Vinci could be seen as ubiquitous technology would obviously require a significant investment. You know, how could you work with customers so the economics associated with that concept at scale could work? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, one of the things that we've built over the last several years, uh, really over the last five or six years, has been a really strong uh, healthcare economics group uh, to complement our, our clinical evaluation group. And those teams work together uh, to really develop the evidence base that can be used in conversations with uh, commercial payers and with government payers and with other regulatory bodies. And we've seen uh, increasing success in our uh, ability to meet the needs of, of those payers and of governments to evaluate these kind of technologies, whether uh, it's reimbursement in Japan, uh, reimbursement in the UK, uh, 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 reimbursement negotiations with private payers or in, in other markets. Um, so what I'd say here is, is we are uh, building that capability. We have a combination of clinical and analytics prowess and really partnering with you. Uh, we have invested um, firmly in our data analytics capabilities, really your data, your truth. The idea that we can sit with you and look at hospital data combined with our robotic system data and use that as the basis of economics analysis that can be shared with the payer side. I think it's been powerful. I invite you uh, to come work with us. Uh, we have a team that can embrace those set of challenges that uh, understands the analytics and the clinical needs and can help in those conversations with payers as we go. I think it's a part of our future. Well, thank you so much for the time, Gary. I think just a pleasure speaking with you. Incredible, um, you know, leadership by yourself and, and firm and what you guys are doing. Just incredible, incredible, incredible. Um, so thank you for all you do. Thank you for all the impact you do with uh, or you have on healthcare. And thank you for the time. We appreciate it greatly. Jessica, a pleasure to sit down with you and have a conversation. And, and thanks so much for your time. Enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.